Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to, uh, my name is Greg Ball. I'm the person who has the privilege of being the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at the University of Maryland. And I want to welcome you all to this year's Sadat Forum, a conversation with America's top diplomat for the Middle East, featuring Ambassador David Satterfield. I am very pleased to introduce Ambassador David Satterfield and Dr. Talhami for uh, today's event. Before I do, I just want to acknowledge the support of President Wallace Lowe of the University of Maryland, who's with us today. Thank you, Wallace. <clears throat> uh, Ambassador David Satterfield is the Acting Assistant Secretary of State, Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. He's held that position since September 2017. He entered the Foreign Service in 1980, and he holds the rank of Career Minister. He most recently served from July 2009 until August 2017 as the Director General of the Multinational Force and Observers in the Sinai Peninsula. At the Department of State, Satterfield served as Coordinator for Iraq, Senior Advisor to the Secretary of State, U.S. Deputy Chief of the Mission in Iraq, Assistant Secretary of State Acting for Near Eastern Affairs, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern, Near Eastern Affairs, Chief of the Mission in Cairo, and U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon. His Middle East experience spans an astonishing 40 years and also includes assignments in Syria, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, and two tours in Lebanon. He served as Director of the Arab and Arab-Israeli Affairs in the Department of State and as Director for Near Eastern Affairs on the National Security Council staff from 93 to 98, where he worked critically on the Arab-Israeli peace process. He is the recipient of the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the Department of State Distinguished Honor Award, the Presidential Distinguished Executive Award, and the Department of the Army Outstanding Civilian Service Award. He is fluent in Arabic and French in addition, of course, to English. And perhaps his greatest achievement is uh, Ambassador Satterfield has a BA from the University of Maryland College Park, awarded in 1976, and we are very proud of him. <laughs> He later went to Georgetown University for a graduate degree, and we are delighted to have him with us today. The conversation will be between Ambassador Satterfield and Sibley Talhami, who is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development and Director of the University of Maryland Critical Issues Poll. Dr. Talhami is also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute. His best-selling book, The Stakes, America in the Middle East, was selected by Foreign Affairs as one of the top five books on the Middle East in 2003. His most recent book, The World Through Arab Eyes, Arab Public Opinion and the Reshaping of the Middle East was published in 2013. Recently, Dr. Talhami was selected by the Carnegie Corporation of New York along with the New York Times as one of the great immigrants for 2013. The Middle East continuing polarization between the Palestinians and the Israelis. This, this area continues to be an area of significance and challenge for our country. The Sadat Forum is one of the best venues at the university for the discussion of major foreign policy issues, and I look forward to hearing this discussion. Thank you both. Thank you. And David, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know how busy you are, and, and those of you um, uh, who are here, um, uh, you should know that uh, he actually was uh, asked to join a meeting this afternoon at the White House and, in fact, sent a, a, uh, an assistant to go there so he can be with us. So we're, we're grateful for you for to, uh, to coming. Uh, Least to, I can do. Uh, yes. Happy to be back. So let me start with something personal. Um, obviously, it's been... Uh, four decades since uh, you graduated, or a little more than four decades since you graduated from the University of Maryland. Uh, and we just, I know you haven't been here uh, very often. Uh, you and I have just uh, taken a walk. You obviously have watched our university over the years. Uh, and uh, I'm just wondering, we have a lot of students here from the university as well as uh, staff and faculty. Uh, if you can just give us uh, your impressions, sort of comparing uh, what you went through and what you see now. Uh, when I came in uh, the fall of 72 uh, to the university, I was a, a commuter uh, from Ellicott City, uh, not a resident. Uh, tuition for an academic year was $405. Um, you spent more in books uh, at the bookstore than you did in, uh, in tuition. What is now the biology, psychology, then zoo psych, 
Uh, the Hornbake Library, then the undergraduate library, had just opened or were in the process of opening uh, that year. I-95 was partially complete uh, and opened for good. Uh, shortly after that, you had to take uh, Colesville Road if you're coming down from the north back then. But that said, this was an outstanding institution then as it is an outstanding institution now. And what made it so was by the fact of its size, by the specialization of its faculty, you could take your interests anywhere you wished to go. And it was a quite common experience, it certainly was in my case, to find that what you really wanted to study, what you really wanted to make your academic experience focus upon was different than your thoughts when you came in. Now at some schools, once you're tracked into a particular program, you are more or less locked in that uh, programmatic track for your four years. That was not the case is not the case with a school like Maryland. And I benefited from the fact that once out of those basic 101 and 201 freshman and sophomore mandatory classes, you could really go anywhere you wanted to. And the faculty, some of whom are still in emeritus status uh, here, uh, were absolutely superb. So if I had to do it again, I would do it again. And that's a praise, not just to the university and the system, but to the state of Maryland uh, for the support that he gave the university. That's the common factor. What is different, of course, is the extraordinary growth and investment in this campus and in the system as a whole. Uh, again, that's a tribute to the quality of the programs, the reputation of the university, uh, continued support uh, from those who know of the university. Uh, the academic standards now uh, are far different than when I came in. You needed a C minus grade point average and a cumulative 600 on your SATs. That's cumulative. And you were guaranteed admission as a state resident. Long ago and far away, as they say. Uh, but you all have done the university proud. You and your predecessors, faculty administration, and students, of course, uh, since then. So I'm very happy to be back. I have nothing but fond memories. Uh, I have to say, uh, I can never forgive uh, the university system for allowing uh, the Terps to switch from the ACC to the Big Ten. Uh, but that grievous fault notwithstanding, uh, Lefty Drizel would spin in his grave. Uh, it's great to be back. Well, it's good to have you. And for me personally as well, to host you here, uh, we've known each other for at least a couple of decades, uh, maybe a quarter century over the years. Uh, uh, everyone knows about your accomplishments and the areas that you cover over a period of almost 40 years in the, in the State Department. So let me start with a, a broad question, uh, and not so much uh, a policy question, but more about how the State Department has really changed over the past four decades. Sure. Uh, both in terms of the process, the structure, the relationship with the White House, the type of people you're attracting. Um, it's very popular, focusing upon the events of the last 15, 16 months, to talk about the degrading of the State Department, the golden ages that must have preceded it, how bad it must be. But I look back with, with a bit longer uh, a breath, 40 years exactly. Uh, when I came in, uh, Wang word processing uh, was still the state of the art. Uh, when you had it, uh, you typed out cables, uh, which then had to be transcribed at a uh, radio teletype machine. A tape was punched and then fed into a machine to send messages out. We had something very cute and quaint called airgrams, which were lengthier uh, telegrams, too long for a communicator to type into a teletype machine and encode, that were literally mailed back to the Department of State. Uh, that was what I came into. People subscribed to home newspapers overseas, which came two, three, four weeks late, because that was the only source of news. If you were at an embassy, you looked forward on Monday morning to going up to the communications room because outside would be a, a printout cut from teletype of the sports scores from the preceding uh, weekend. You had no other way of accessing them. Short wave was a popular hobby because that's how you stayed in touch. Now that's all a, a nostalgic look back, but I'll make the comment should we use soft. The quality of the work of the U.S. government's foreign affairs, national security community across all the agencies involved 
and there are most of the agencies of the US government involved in some way in national security affairs, is better today, done at a higher level of proficiency uh, than anything I've seen in 40 years. Speaking for the State Department alone, the quality of our staff, the quality of the incoming Foreign Service officers, the quality of their writing, their ability to write to task, the precision of analysis, the precision of policy recommendations is more disciplined, more structured, is better today than at any point in my experience. I came back into the department uh, after several years uh, a half step away. Coming back in as head of this bureau for the second time, I was last acting assistant secretary uh, 12 years ago, uh, I was impressed by how much better the written product was the verbal briefing skills of the officer corps were. Now what's that a tribute to? Well, I'd like to say it's a product of the Department of State and our disciplines. And it is, in fact, it is a product of the extraordinary demands placed on an officer's time. You have only so many hours a day. The work has to be done proficiently in a high level. Tolerance for those who can't do at that level is far less than it was when I came in when there was still enormous space, uh, particularly at very senior levels, for, shall we say, low performers who had gone to the right schools, belonged to the right clubs, and who were accommodated endlessly, well beyond normal retirement years. None of that could be or is the case today. But it's also a product of the educational system. And I like to think still, I'll make a plug for arts and humanities, yeah. that, that focus on the liberal arts, on reading, writing, exposure to style rubs off and carries through in whatever you do in your professions, be it in the sciences uh, or in the liberal arts or in the practice of diplomacy. So my overall judgment, it's the best both foreign service but best US government national security policy focus and integration I've ever seen. Part of that's technology, but most of it's people. Well, let me be specific to the Near East Bureau. Um, you know, in, uh, uh, right after, in, in, uh, around the Iraq War time, um, I served on a, a State Department commission uh, as an outside member uh, that was headed by Ed DeRigian, if you recall, mm -hmm. on what was called public diplomacy. And I co-drafted the report, actually, on public diplomacy. And we did kind of an evaluation of the State Department staff, uh, particularly with those who focus on the Middle East. And we found, I recall in our report, there were, there were only a handful of people who were fluent enough in Arabic to engage the media and other people in a conversation. Of all the State Department at every level uh, at that time, and that was only, at, may, may have been 2004, 2005, so has that changed, or is that still an issue? Shibley, I was a US Iraq coordinator uh, during much of that, that time. And one of the things we had to grapple with was how can you have a truly functional expeditionary, uh, Condi Rice's term, diplomatic corps, when you weren't language proficient, when you weren't able to function completely comfortably in an external environment where English was not a language that you could rely upon, and where translators uh, were really not a suitable way of carrying on a dialogue. There are many negative fruits, tainted fruits, of the entire Iraq experience, and I don't want to minimize that at all. But there are also positive outcomes in terms of structures for the service, and one of them was a much greater focus on language skills. Now, for Arabic, it has meant an exponential growth in the number of Arabic proficient uh, foreign service officers. But it has meant changes completely in the way we teach languages, not just Arabic, but other hard languages as well. Instead of a rigid structure where you went to a Washington a Foreign Service Institute uh, out in, in Annandale, uh, and then went to an overseas school, Garmish in those days for Russian, uh, Sidi Bou Said outside Tunis uh, for Arabic, uh, different places for different uh, programs. Now we integrate into communities throughout the world, into university systems, think tanks, academic institutions around the region, around the world. And what you get is a far greater practical grasp of language, a far greater proficiency 
uh, just as a foreign exchange student has to acquire. You're living in the culture. You're working in an academic environment in which you've got to speak or sink. And we get far better results from that. So if you compared the proficient levels 4-4 and above in those days to today, no, no comparison whatsoever. Really, that's good. Uh, I, well, l despite that, let me just uh, ask a question that is not sort of over the past 40 years, but over the past two years or year and a half. Uh, that has to do with what's going on in the State Department. Now, I'll read you a quote uh, from uh, one of your former bosses, uh, Colin Powell, uh, in today's uh, New Yorker. Uh, uh, it's an article about uh, the firing of Secretary Tillerson. Uh, and the article um, specifically, is the, Powell is quoted as saying that the administration, quote, is ripping the guts out of the organization. When you stop bringing people in, or when you make the State Department an undesirable place to be, then you are mortgaging your future. So obviously very, very critical words from uh, the Secretary of State about what's taken place. Now there's, to put that aside for a minute, maybe the, the sort of language that uh, Powell used. Um, there are a lot of, we know there are a lot of vacancies. I don't know in historical perspective, maybe you could tell us whether this is uh, about the norm or much more unusual in terms of uh, uh, ambassadorships uh, that are vacant in, on, on, in countries where we have uh, pressing interests. And so is that, is, is there something going on that's a little bit different, or is this part of a typical transition from administration? See the number of vacancies in Senate-confirmed positions uh, as we have today. Uh, a comment. Mid-grade ranks. Uh, there really hasn't been that much in moving forward. Uh, they have rewarding, challenging jobs, challenging the star general critical transition level. That's more or less in line with historic norms. Um, where things have hit the hardest are in entries. There are fewer uh, generalist officers uh, entering the service over the past year. Uh, than in typical norm years uh, of the last 30 or 40. And there are, at the very senior ranks, officers who have been ambassadors once or twice are looking to the next more senior assignment. Uh, people making the decision that either their future is sufficiently opaque, uh, that they do not see, uh, given competition from private sector, academia, where to go, uh, a desire to stay in, or really don't have a choice in the matter. And the loss at the very beginning, new blood, the loss at the top, quite senior and experienced staff, that's a problem. Is this the first time it's happened? No, not at all. Uh, we have lived through, in my experience, at least three such uh, periods. And the bubble that passes through the system over the decades takes quite a long while to work out. It can be a quarter of a century before you recover from a year or two of a freeze on hiring, we've had that in the past, or very diminished hiring. Uh, so it isn't something that can be cured or fixed immediately, but I'm not sure I would use quite the phrase uh, ripped the guts out, uh, which has a ring to it, but uh, well, uh, obviously that, that I, Powell did. I, I mean, we, we both know uh, Secretary Powell and respect him. Uh, he's certainly been there and has, uh, you know, uh, have quite a, a deep experience with, with the bureaucracy. But I think he's not only talking about what has happened, but obviously he's making a judgment about what the plan is. Part of that is that uh, with expressed attitude in the discourse about bureaucracies of government, period, uh, of which the State Department is one. And it starts with political appointees. So you are now, uh, you're a professional diplomat. You rose to this highest position in the US government overseeing the Near East, uh, you're gonna be replaced by a political appointee. Uh, and I, to my knowledge, this is uh, the, only the second time and the first time was an experienced person who had already been in government but not a career a diplomat. Um, so I think 
is do you see, uh, I, I'm not talking about the particular individual, put aside the particular individual because we see appointees. Uh, uh, my own experience with the State Department uh, is that uh, amazing professionals. Uh, I've been incredibly impressed over the years by um, how uh, well informed, how knowledgeable, how dedicated most of the people I interacted with in, in the Department of State, but are they being listened to? And if you have political appointees, are they gonna make a difference? And people in the White House where you have fewer of the people who are coming from the State Department and more either coming from the outside or from the military, how do you see that playing itself out? Oh, certainly these things happen. And you know what? The system accommodates uh, and rolls on. Uh, the, our military colleagues often reflect to us, how do you do it? If we had two, three, and four-star generals who were political appointees, we couldn't function. Uh, and I leave that quote in their mouths rather than mine. All right, um, I, I, I get, I get uh, you, you, you're still an acting assistant professor, assistant uh, 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 secretary, uh, secretary of state. I'd like to think I'd be full or emeritus <laughs> by you, now. You would, you would be chaired <laughs> professor by now, but um, the, uh, I, I, I get that. Um, uh, maybe we'll have, you, uh, we'll have you come back after you leave your, your office to, to answer that question. Uh, but I want to I want to change I want to turn to policy questions um, and um, I want to I have a, a lot of targeted policy questions I want to ask you about but I want to start with a broader question um, and that is um, I've known you for for many years I've watched you uh, 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 you know in, in all these different positions that you've taken on you have a view of the challenges uh, that uh, we face in the, in the Middle East region uh, so if I were to ask you, uh, how do you see the challenges broadly, not just from issue to issue, but in general, what is the biggest challenge and what do you think are America's priority right now, American policy priorities toward the region? I think uh, from my standpoint of the Middle East Bureau, I see two overarching challenges. Uh, one is the, the consequences of the better part of a century of failed models of governance socioeconomic policy, the misuse of Islam uh, as a sort of political aspect in which to enshrine and freeze class, structural entitlements, exclusive rather than inclusive systems. This is quite a burden. It's a historic generational challenge. It was built over history. It was built generationally and it will not be cured or worked out in a day, a month, or a year. And in the end, it will have to be the people of the region, as it was the challenge for the people of other regions, Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, to work out these same, as it was for us, to work out our unique uh, inheritances, the chains we bore, and in some cases still do. It doesn't happen overnight. But it comes at a moment when the rise of violent to reach out both in direct forms, acts of terror, but to reach out through social media, something quite new, in terms of propagating, inciting acts of violence far removed from the Middle East by individuals who are not part of a coherent structure or organization, something capable of being addressed through classic uh, policing or national security measures. This cyber challenge, which we hear so much about, uh, is something that adds to the dimensions uh, of this problem. So this is one of the two fundamental issues. The second fundamental issue is Russia. The question of what does Putin want? Is he a transactional actor? Areas of disagreement, which may be profound, but in the end, a rational actor who, with whom one can seek and maintain areas of coincident interest, common concerns, common interests, deals can be made, not on everything, but on some things, or is it zero sum? Is it an attempt to work out both personal as well as national ambitions, venging old perceived wrongs from the fall of the Soviet Union and its domination of Eastern Union, and then the fall of the Union itself. What is it? 
How do you engage? How do you conduct relations? How do you manage this on a global scale? Now that issue, the Russian issue, has many dimensions outside the Middle East, but it also has a profound Middle East dimension, and the nexus point is clearly Syria, where we add in a third issue which I would not place at the same level uh, of geostrategic consequence as the first two, which is Iran's ambitions and ability to act upon those ambitions uh, in a manner which is deeply threatening and challenging uh, to many of the peoples of the Middle East, to US interests, and more broadly speaking in this interconnected world, to interests in Europe, Horn of Africa, Russia itself, and the so-called near abroad uh, for Russia. So uh, let me then ask you a specific question about Syria, because some of those, you mentioned Syria and you mentioned Russia's role and Iran's role there. Um, obviously, the US has uh, joined uh, Britain and France in attacking uh, three targets uh, in Syria uh, after uh, Assad uh, was found to have used uh, First of all, uh, uh, the question that was raised, uh, Senator, uh, raising a question about whether that that uh, uh, Assad used chemical weapons. That's one of the uh, uh, with uh, attacking Assad over use of chemical weapons. We've seen that from left to right. There, there are people on the left who have. Uh, you know, uh, supported the president's action because they think that's, you know, a good issue, this is a human rights issue. And you've had people on the right. But you've had a lot of people, including surprisingly Republicans, uh, as well as Democrats, who are raising questions about uh, not only the acting without congressional authorization uh, or uh, appeal to particular international law, there's a question there, but more importantly in terms of what, uh, what has been put forth as evidence. Now, the evidence uh, that has been put, at least in the public domain, uh, has been mostly non-direct evidence, that is evidence put forth, forth on the social, uh, throughout the social media. So do we need to, to be able to carry out something on that scale, uh, do we need to persuade people that we have evidence? Have we, have we put out evidence, or are we in a position to put out evidence? Where does that stand? Sure, well, it's always best when military force or forces are used to have as clear and compelling a case, not within policymakers' circles uh, in the U.S. or abroad, uh, but at the, at the popular level, the public level. And the less you can do that, the more these kinds of questions come. In uh, we had the ability, the international into the site of the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. The evidence, the medical evidence. Two things. We watched the use of chemical weapons, and for us, uh, the intelligence, the information available, uh, which was not just social media, although that was quite extraordinary, uh, was absolutely compelling and characteristic of the some 40 odd uses uh, reported of chemical weapons uh, utilization by the Assad regime over the course of the last uh, year, year plus. Uh, but more broadly, we saw something else. We saw active measures to clean the site, to make it impossible for the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, uh, to come in and collect the kind of forensic evidence they had been able to conduct in April. And it was this acceleration of site cleansing um, that was one of the factors in the end that led us to act without the ability to present this internationally verified uh, medical forensics that we had on previous occasion. And I just want to touch on this. I said 40 odd uses of chemical weapons by this regime, uh, most of them use of weaponized chlorine, uh, mainly in the form of dropped barrel bombs from helicopters, some in the form of grenades uh, filled with chlorine. Why didn't we act 40 times? Because our standard for use of our forces, of our force, is very high. And in those other cases, we felt the evidentiary standard, although we were convinced was compelling, was not enough to meet this threshold. The question that's often asked, and you didn't, is 400 to 500,000 
Syrians have died in this conflict. Most of them have died by the crudest, the most conventional of conventional weapons. Why didn't you act to stop that? Why single out chemical weapons use? And you can view my answer as acceptable or not, but there is a special opprobrium that has attached around the world uh, since 1916 to 1918 to the use of chemical weapons. Rightly or wrongly, they are viewed as an instrument of war and violence that globally, not just in Syria, has to be responded to. When we acted in Duma, we made very clear that while the proximate place we were acting was Syria, we believe the international community has an obligation to respond to chemical weapons use anywhere. And you will note that our response to the use of a chemical weapon in Salisbury, England, was quite serious and quite severe. If you show tolerance, acceptance for CW usage in one place, you tacitly approve its use or show you won't respond to its use elsewhere. Should we respond to all barbaric killing? In an absolute moral sense, of course. But in the world we live in, have lived in, you have to draw priorities. And for us, the chemical weapons use was an absolute priority. We believe the evidence was compelling and we saw absolute indication that that evidence was being progressively removed, eliminated, cleaned from the site. Well, um, let's assume the evidence was strong. Obviously, you feel that way, and clearly that's the consensus within, uh, not only in the US, but obviously in France and, and the UK who joined in the attack. Um, uh, we, the US st struck a uh, chemical, uh, struck a, a, a uh, an air base in Syria last year after uh, Assad was found to have used chemical weapons. Uh, you say he's used them 40 times since. Obviously, that attack did not deter yes. him from using them. Uh, right now, uh, clearly, uh, if you look at it in terms of effect, we don't know whether it'll deter him or not. He's used chemical weapons. And uh, politically, uh, I think the the takeaway is that he's probably stronger politically after the attack than not, because his, his military is not profoundly undermined. He's winning, uh, to, to, to the extent that winning, I put that with quotation <coughs> mark. Yes. Uh, but he's certainly, he's got the upper hand. The Russians is supporting him probably more than they were before. Uh, so are the Iranians. So how is that itself a, success when you carry out an attack like that? The purpose of this attack was focused on chemical weapons use. It was not focused on accelerating regime change or in changing the direction of events in Syria writ broadly. It was, as was our response to the Salisbury attack, focused on Does Assad retain the capacity to use chemical weapons? Yes, that's our assessment. Will this attack deter more effectively the use of chemical weapons than the attack in April of last year? While we hope that would be the case, we are fully prepared and we've spoken quite openly of the possibility that it will not deter him. And the president has said, as have our international partners, that in that case, depending on the circumstances, depending on the availability of evidence of use and that very high threshold and standard, we would be prepared to act again. So is this a closed one-off? It would be if CW was not again used. It will not be if CW is. So um, if you uh, uh, look at the situation in Syria broadly, uh, you have started off by um, uh, highlighting the challenge that Putin's, Putin, particularly as, as, as president of, of Russia, uh, poses particularly about the uncertainty of what his aims are uh, in the region. And obviously Syria is one place uh, where uh, he staked out a major interest, where he's uh, uh, looked at Assad as one of his major allies, where he's preparing to f put his foot down uh, in a very decisive way. Although, Shibley, I would interrupt you there to, to make a comment. I don't believe Putin looks at Assad 
as an ally. He sees Assad as a pragmatic bulwark against greater chaos and uncertainty, A, in a very zero-sum bottom line assessment sense. If the Arab mind focuses on fitna wa fawda, uh, dissolution and chaos as the ultimate enemy of, of society, of order above all uh, being the goal to preserve, Many in Russia do as well, and I think for Vladimir Putin, that same idea of order, even order at a very high price, and order sustained by the fist is extremely valuable. That's one way in which Assad is an instrument. The other is a much broader policy instrument. Putin demonstrates he will go against the tenor of the world, the Arab world, the West, in pursuing what he believes to be goals that go far beyond Syria, which is Russia as the great actor, Russia as the confident arbiter, Russia as the place to which the United States in the end must come, as will others, uh, to hammer out a new arrangement. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, there is a little bit of wiggle room. Some people have been help, hopeful that that broader aim may incline the Russians to, uh, to have a different attitude about the Assad presidency. But regardless of where Russia is, uh, if you look at the situation in Syria right now, uh, probably the most immediate risk is for an Israeli-Iranian confrontation. Uh, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I wonder if you agree with that, in the sense that uh, whatever Russia wants in Syria, it certainly doesn't want uh, a direct confrontation with the U.S. Uh, if you are looking at what happened now, the, the Iranians have been building, taken a, a direct uh, attack on Iranian capabilities and killed seven soldiers. And clearly the Iranians have been making noises that they will retaliate, they will not let that go. And, and, and there is a, a uh, expectation in Israel that this could lead into a direct confrontation with Iran. Is that, is that fair to say, or how do you see that? Sure. We are very concerned, and we have made those concerns clear for quite some time. At the consequences for regional security and stability of Iran's aggressive, accelerating proliferation of advanced weapons systems both into Syria itself and through Syria into Lebanon. Uh, we regard this as deeply destabilizing. It raises, no matter what kind of strategic calculus you, you want to run, uh, increasingly greater odds of a confrontation. And a confrontation which, in 2018, is far different in its potential dimensions than was uh, the 2006 or 1996 exchanges between Israel and Hezbollah. Russia is present. Iran directly is present. Uh, this is not a situation in which anything which throws fuel onto an already burning fire should be done. And when the president spoke to the association of Russia with Syria and the fact that this is not a proximity that, that Russia should want, you should not want to be identified uh, with states, with governments that act towards their citizens as the Assad regime has done. Uh, the same could also be said of Iran. Does Russia see Iran's presence in Syria as something over time uh, which produces a situation Russia believes is in its interest at home or in the near abroad? Uh, we would question that. We see a common risk here, a common danger here, and it's one that we would very much hope Russia would join with us and basically the rest of the world in confronting. Uh, rather than either stepping aside uh, or uh, in an indirect fashion of facilitating. Um, I, are you saying that you think that Russia has uh, restraining power on, on Iran? I mean, right now, the big question is whether Iran is going to retaliate uh, in a way that is direct and, and visible. Uh, uh, and, and if they do, you know that it's going to lead to an escalation. We would uh, certainly hope, Shipley, that Russia, for its own sake, not for the sake of the U.S. or any other party, would do all in its power in terms of connections, dialogue, and messaging 
to urge upon Tehran the maximum degree of restraint. That's in the first instance. But strategically, we would hope that Russia would join the rest of the international community uh, in making very clear that the continued expansion of Iranian presence and influence and proliferation uh, in Syria as well as elsewhere in the region serves no one's interests but Tehran. And uh, in, in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very fascinated by um, the sense that you seem to project that Russia will have that, uh, that degree of influence with Iran, uh, particularly on something uh, that uh, they see as strategically central in their deterrence uh, posture, and, uh, and Russia being rather angry with the U.S. at the moment, having attacked uh, its allies' uh, facilities. So, uh, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm interested in that, but I want to, I want to move on. So I want to um, uh, talk about two related issues to this. I'll start with uh, the Lebanon situation. Uh, you mentioned Hezbollah. Obviously, Hezbollah is a main factor in Lebanese politics, a central player. It has been a player in Syrian politics and obviously an ally of Iran as well. And the fear originally had been about escalation between Hezbollah and Israel. Now we're focused on a direct confrontation between Israel and, and Iran. But if you look at the situation in Lebanon, I know this is one that you're close to. You're close to in more ways than one, more than anyone here for sure, but maybe more than anyone in the U.S. right now. Uh, you have served there as ambassador. You have mediated there recently. Uh, you're very close to the events that have unfolded in the past year and a half. And so I would really be interested in your take on two things. One is uh, the circumstances of the forced resignation by Prime Minister Hariri in Saudi Arabia, and then his restoration to, uh, to power, in essence, in, in Lebanon, and, and where you see that uh, now in terms of the stability of the government under the circumstances. Uh, and two, on issue that you have, I believe, mediated of late, uh, the uh, border issues or, or maritime issues and the gas uh, 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 facilities issues with Israel in terms of is that an issue that we have to watch and worry about? Is that really just a commercial issue? With respect to Prime Minister Hariri, uh, the international community uh, with pretty much a single voice uh, expressed its deep uh, concern and outrage uh, over what had happened to the Prime Minister, made very clear at the highest levels uh, that it, the situation had to be brought to an end, and the Prime Minister, as Prime Minister, allowed to return to Beirut. And indeed, that is what happened. Uh, and there was no dissonance or hesitation uh, at all in coming to the conclusion as soon as it was understood what was going on, uh, that there was really uh, no other choice uh, for the broad international community. And we, along with others uh, with influence in the situation, uh, acted in a fashion which uh, those who think we always speak, we diplomats, in extraordinarily convoluted uh, and cryptic language uh, would have been surprised at the bluntness uh, of our tone on get this ended and let him go back, uh, because that's just how sharp the messaging well, was. Was there a total surprise in the U.S. government at every there level? There was a total surprise at every level, yes. Yes, there was, and in the international community at every level. Uh, with respect to Lebanon, we strongly support the legitimate institutions of the Lebanese state. Uh, we have provided, we the United States, uh, extraordinary support, and not just financial support, for institutions such as the Lebanese Armed Forces, the Internal Security Forces. Uh, we see building up and strengthening these legitimate entities of Lebanon as one of the best counters to the illegitimate uh, entities that exist in Lebanon, including Hezbollah and Hezbollah's militia. We regard Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. We make no distinction, nor have we, between so-called political and so-called military wings. We can't, because the evidence doesn't permit it. And it doesn't permit it for any other state as well. If they maintain that distinction, they do so for their own political reasons, not based on a question regarding the evidence. But we believe the best way to see a democratic, prosperous, stable Lebanon 
move forward is to support its institutions to help provide bulwarks to Lebanon and its government against the many challenges that it faces. And Lebanon, of course, faces an extraordinary, unprecedented challenge now in that you have over one and a quarter million Syrian refugees uh, present on Lebanese soil. No state has had, in terms of, of its demographic makeup, had to absorb in such a short time uh, such a large percentage of, of refugees or migrants. And this is and will be a challenge for Lebanon in a social, uh, in an economic, and ultimately a political and security sense for many years to come, which is why we want to see a global resolution to both the internally displaced and externally displaced Syrian uh, populations. How do you get that global solution by restoring peace and stability to Syria? How do you get there? Well, there's only one way to do it, and it's not through a so-called military victory uh, for the Assad regime. It's a political process that has as its end state a different picture, a different model of governance in Syria than the one that prevailed before 2012. If you go back to the status quo ante, and you can't really, the regime is diminished in many critical ways uh, in terms of ability to exert and sustain control. But if you go back to the same patterns of governance, you will have a Syria that is a generator of violent extremism, of violence, both within its borders and outside its borders, once again. It will be neither stable nor secure. Again, a point we make to our Russian friends. Now, with, uh, uh, with the situation being as it is internally, for now, uh, relatively uh, stable but challenging, um, there's been a lot of worries about confrontation between Hezbollah and Israel. And certainly, if there's direct confrontation between Iran and, uh, and Israel. Uh, what's your evaluation of that? Is this something you worry about? Is this something you see as uh, the Israeli press often talks about it as an inevitable war? I don't, uh, I don't speak about any conflict as inevitable. But if you continue aggressive, accelerated proliferation of threatening systems, if you act with those systems in threatening fashion, you increase the odds that conflict can result, despite the strategic intentions of all sides. Miscalculation, misadventure, unpredictable reaction can become the models. Um, a related issue to, to round up this conversation on, on Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah uh, is the Iran nuclear deal, uh, the so-called JCPOA. Uh, and obviously, uh, this was a main accomplishment of the Obama administration, uh, achieving that deal, uh, believing that that was the best path uh, to reduce the chance that Iran would build nuclear weapons. Um, obviously, this administration has not seen it that way. Uh, many in Congress have opposed it from the beginning. It was an uphill battle for Obama to get it through. Uh, uh, we know Secretary Tillerson uh, thought it was a good agreement, was not in favor of walking away from it. This is obviously an international agreement. It's not just a U.S.-Iran agreement. The U.S. is a participant in, on the international side. We have a deadline coming up in May, um, and there is uh, a lot of expectation that the U.S. will pull out. Uh, and, and then it's uncertain whether or not the administration or Congress will push for additional sanctions on Iran that would be essentially in violation of the agreement itself. Uh, w first, where do you see that headed? Uh, and I know this is obviously a White House decision, but where do you see that headed? And second, what if the U.S. does pull out? Uh, what are the dangers ahead? How do, you, how do you see this playing itself out? Policy of the administration is to pursue a resolution that cures what we regard as the three significant defects or unaddressed issues in the JCPOA. One is long-range ballistic missile development technology transfer, uh, which was not addressed in the JCPOA. Uh, the second are certain um, authorities for intrusive inspection. Uh, the third is the sunset clauses, uh, which essentially say at a certain point, certain constraints that are in the text of the JCPOA over enrichment, the enrichment cycle, uh, will lapse. And in theory, Iran would be free to engage in those uh, enrichment behaviors. 
Um, we are heavily engaged as I speak with the so-called E3, Germany, the UK, and France, uh, to see if a resolution can be reached on these three areas. Uh, and our intent, as uh, Secretary Nominate Pompeo said during his testimony, uh, is to get a success here. Uh, that's the policy, that's what we're working on right now. And frankly, surely I'm not gonna comment on hypotheticals uh, as to what may happen if that goal can't be achieved. We're focused on getting to success here. I, I get that. Um, so let me uh, move quickly to one issue uh, that I know you've been uh, asked about a lot, particularly in Congress, uh, and that is the Yemen war. Uh, I know you've uh, been questioned a lot on it, particularly. Could say. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, and, and, and for good reason. Uh, for good reason in the sense that uh, if you look at Yemen, it's a devastated country. Uh, the UN says this is now the greatest humanitarian crisis uh, uh, internationally. Uh, there have been thousands of people killed and refugees uh, created, as well as obviously a lot of people who are uh, uh, in danger, including children. So it's a, a humanitarian uh, crisis is very serious indeed. Uh, and I want to I want to give you a little bit of an interpretation, uh, and I want you to tell me a reaction to it. Uh, and that is that uh, uh, the U.S. is essentially has reluctantly acquiesced in the Saudi-led war in Yemen. I say reluctantly acquiesced. Uh, and I say that beginning with the Obama administration, not the Trump administration, uh, because obviously it started under Obama. And that Obama was so focused on the Iran nuclear deal and so happy to get a reluctant acquiescence in the deal from the Saudis that he was happy to provide reluctant acquiescence uh, for uh, the Saudi-led war in Yemen, and that this Trump administration has placed so much value in <clears throat> the relationship with Saudi Arabia on other issues, Iran, uh, Middle East peace, uh, uh, fighting uh, terrorism, uh, that, uh, that in essence, the Yemen not being a priority for anyone really in a strategic picture pays the price, and we go on with uh, reluctant acquiescence uh, in, in, in the uh, Saudi-led war in Yemen. Uh, so I want your reaction to that. Shively, at the time the Obama administration made the critical decisions in spring of 2015 uh, to join in to assist in this Saudi-led campaign, uh, uh, it had various motivations and frankly, uh, I was not in the this policy-making circle at that time. I'm not going to comment back, but I will comment on the policies of this administration. Uh, we are deeply concerned and have expressed that publicly as well as privately before the Congress and in other fora at the use of military force to attempt to obtain a political resolution or a political outcome in this country. 29 million Yemenis, 22 million of whom are dependent on some form of external feeding uh, or medical support. A million cases of cholera, the greatest cholera outbreak in the world. Uh, a country devastated by more civil wars in the course of the uh, certainly in the Middle East, uh, perhaps in the world. This is a tormented, tortured geographic entity, the state of Yemen. The last thing it needs is more torment, more torture, more destruction, more instability. There has to be a political resolution. It cannot come through military force. That said, and that last message has been made very clear, including by the president, uh, to the leaders of the coalition. What has to happen here are several things. First, we are committed to support the legitimate defensive needs, particularly of Saudi Arabia, which has been subject both to short range as well as longer range rocket attack by Iranian missiles facilitated by the Revolutionary Guard Corps in Houthi territory launched at Riyadh Airport, launched at other critical infrastructure targets in Saudi Arabia. We have 80,000 American citizens in Saudi Arabia. The consequences of American citizens are killed by an Iranian missile whose launch was facilitated at the point of launch by the Revolutionary Guard Corps would be extremely severe. So we are doing what we can to help Saudi Arabia defend itself. We are also doing all we can 
to stop this Iranian exploitative proliferation. Iran plays in the fissures, plays in the cracks, plays in the chaos that has beset too many places in the Middle East. Yemen is one of them, Syria is certainly another. But to force a political resolution through military force is not something we believe is possible, nor that we can sustain. We have strongly supported, and just yesterday, we met with the new UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths, a quite experienced international negotiator and peacemaker uh, with, with a long and distinguished record. And our message to him was, you have carte blanche. You meet with who you want, when you want, where you want, and you will have our support, our being a broad coalition of like-minded uh, states. And we will continue to back the UN's efforts here. But as we back the UN efforts, and this is something that uh, the US Congress in the form of the Senate and I spoke to during testimony two days ago, the administration has also welcomed the very clear message which the Congress has provided, which is this humanitarian crisis has to be addressed. And that force cannot be used in a fashion that exacerbates the crisis, particularly when it is aimed at extracting a political goal. And that's been a powerful and not an unuseful message for the administration. And it's one on which we in the Congress have common ground. So one question, one final short question on Yemen, uh, which is if I'm looking at Yemen as an observer, uh, I, um, uh, you know, I, I don't follow Yemen as closely, I've been there. I, I was in Oman recently talking to the Omanis about how they see Yemen, and obviously they have their own take on the Yemen conflict. But most people I know would say that if you compare Iranian influence in Yemen uh, 2015 to now, it's much more now than it was in 2015. That's correct. Well, that, that, that's the point, that the war actually given the Iran far more of a, a foothold in Yemen than exactly they had before. Exactly correct. And that's part of the problem. But let me, let me move to the final question I want to ask you before I open it up uh, for questions to the, the audience. Uh, and it, just a small question about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so, uh, let me start with, uh, you, you, you walked across campus and you saw uh, you know, Israeli students celebrating, you saw Arab students uh, protesting. This obviously were the 17th anniversary of, of, of uh, the establishment of Israel and also of the Palestinian Nakba or catastrophe as it, as it is remembered among Palestinians. Very, very uh, uh, important uh, mark uh, and just last year, uh, obviously, we, we had another important anniversary, uh, that of the 1967 war that led to Israeli control of, uh, uh, of the rest of what was uh, Palestine. Uh, and obviously, no, no uh, uh, agreement on the horizon. Uh, in some ways, we're worse off than we were uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so I want to ask you a couple of questions on that. Who's doing the policy? So again, uh, this uh, uh, article today uh, quotes, uh, it talks about uh, uh, Secretary Tillerson. And Tillerson um, uh, was asked uh, if he was frustrated when responsibilities were handed to Jared Kushner in the White House instead of being handed to the State Department for this issue, the Israel-Palestine issue, which, um, it, presidents have been involved in it, often had envoys, but almost always even the envoys were stationed in the State Department, whether it was uh, you know, Mitchell or Dennis Ross or, or, or Martin Indyk, they were, even when they acted as presidential envoys, it was still anchored in the State Department and reporting it partly uh, to, uh, to the Secretary of State. So here's what, what, what uh, Tillerson surprisingly said. He said, oh no, it was pretty clear in the beginning that the president wanted him to work on the Middle East peace process, and so we carved it out. We carved that out. So the State Department basically said, you know, this is this is not our mandate. This is this is outside of our our mandate. Um, first of all, how unusual is that? And a follow-up is um, the question on Jerusalem, particularly. 
put aside now the whole peace process. The, obviously, the, uh, the uh, administration's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem has been, had gone against every American position historically, really to the very, dating to the very beginning. The U.S. had never recognized Jerusalem as, as capital of Israel. Uh, and uh, clearly went against the advice of many, and I suspect many in the State Department. The president makes that decision. It's, he's the president of the United States. He sets policy. He did. He set policy. But I want to ask you two questions about that. Uh, one question is, uh, can you explain to us uh, something that has been given out publicly, uh, which is that taking Jerusalem off the table is actually helpful to peacemaking? So how do you understand that this is not your argument, this is the argument that was given by uh, White House representatives trying to explain uh, the move? Uh, and maybe I don't follow the argument, but as you understand it, how is that particularly helpful to moving the peace process forward? Well, Shibley, I'll, I'll respond to the first part of your question by saying for the better part of the last 30 years, uh, I've been involved in, in one way or another with the, what's called the Middle East peace process. And I was myself one of those Middle East envoys from 2001 to 2003, uh, based partly in Jerusalem, partly in the, the U.S. Uh, I cannot say that our track record uh, during that time uh, was particularly distinguished. It was the parties, Jordan and Israel, Palestinians and Israel, both before Oslo and in the two years before Rabin's assassination after Oslo, that advanced the process. It was engagement of, of a difficult character, but engagement nevertheless between the Syrian regime uh, and Israel uh, that moved things forward as they did. The U.S. could facilitate the U.S. could provide incentives and inducements, uh, but in the end, it was the parties themselves who achieved the progress that was made during those years, and I give them absolute and full credit. The convening of the Madrid conference after the first Gulf War provided a more facilitated package, envelope, international context for peacemaking. Uh, but in the end, it was the parties who took the initiative, and so I am appropriately modest and circumspect about critiquing or criticizing any dedication or commitment to trying to move this forward. Any degree of energy from whatever government office it may be. Uh, I am not in any way particularist to the Department of State uh, on this one. So I welcome and wish the best uh, to all of those who are devoting energy and, and commitment to this. Well, it, it's notable, of course, that that particular uh, move has made it impossible for the Palestinians to come back to the negotiating table, uh, which obviously makes it impossible for the Qataris to reach a, a, a solution. Um, but let me end with one uh, smaller question, uh, which is about the two-state solution. Um, I say that because, uh, you know, I've been, uh, like you, uh, following this issue, writing about it, thinking about it, or involved in some ways in it for, for many years. The two-state solution has been, uh, in essence, the, the aim of uh, all peace negotiations of recent, in recent years, and some of us advocated it before it was even popular as, as the only way that we could move forward or see an end to that, to that conflict. Uh, and uh, we have been saying, you know, it's uh, for, for about 20 years, we're saying if it doesn't happen next year, it'll never happen. And of course, it's been 20 years since we've been saying that. Uh, and we still are thinking that it is going to happen. Now, analytically, um, when you talk to Palestinians and Israelis, in fact, I do polling, as you know, in Israel and the Palestinian areas, and majorities of Israelis and Palestinians don't think it'll ever happen. It's not that they don't want it. They're making mm -hmm. an objective assessment that it's just not going to happen. Uh, when you talk to analysts, the overwhelming majority of analysts who follow this, you, you talk to them privately, say, I don't think it's, it's going to happen. When I talk to American officials privately, they will say, I don't think it'll ever happen. Uh, uh, when you talk to politicians privately, not uh, you know, in, in public, they will say, I don't think it'll ever happen. So I'm just wondering whether we're all hanging on to this because we don't have a broader alternative. That is, the, 
you know, what do we advocate if we don't have a two-state solution? Uh, American public opinion, well, uh, when you ask Americans in our public opinion poll, what would you support if there was no two-state solution? Would you support a Jewish state uh, but without Arabs getting full equality? Or would you support a democratic state that is no longer Jewish? The majority of Americans of every party say they select the second, a democratic state that's no longer Jewish. That includes, by the way, Republicans. And I say that's surprising because we're polarized on every issue almost. And sometimes the polarization is like 80 percentage point difference. We still get a majority of uh, independents, a majority of, of, of uh, Democrats, a majority of Republicans saying if push comes to shove, uh, they would choose a democratic state over it being Jewish because it goes against the the, 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 you know, the, the raison d'etre of being an American. And uh, if that's the case, uh, one wonders whether uh, our inability to postulate outcomes is really kind of a, uh, an escape, a, a comfort zone where we go to it. Uh, because no, one, no American politician or official is going to say, I don't want a Jewish state. It's politically impossible, uh, practically. <coughs> Uh, and no one is going to say, I don't want a democratic state, for sure. And so uh, it leaves us in a place of uh, hanging on to an idea uh, that perpetuates the possibility of it happening down the road, but essentially not doing anything practical. That's why, in some ways, uh, President Trump, with you, whether you agree with him or not, the fact that he said, uh, you know, let's open it up. Maybe he is opening it up in the, uh, not the, like some people would like, but at least he's putting that idea on the table that we need to, to deal with the reality on the ground. So how do you see it? I see it as I've always seen it, as in the hands of the parties. I have always diminished the directive, determinative role of the United States, or more broadly, the quartet or the international community in stepping in in an issue which must reflect in the end um, a basic view of the center of the polities, both Palestinian and Israeli, which can be shaped and molded by leaderships, yes, fully accept that. Uh, the role of leadership is critical here, but it is not in the end determinative. You have got to have broad support, you have to have leadership that is willing to take the necessary steps to move ahead on what is, in the end, a difficult process of compromise from maximalist goals to accepting something else. The US can encourage and support, but never was in the position of directing. Much as we like to, or may like to mythologize uh, the strength of our position, even at those moments when our standing was the highest amongst all parties. Uh, to this conflict. We weren't able to do it. And I will recall to you the very sad note on which Bill Clinton uh, left office and what his message was to George W. Bush, which is, stay out of this. I remember. I remember. Well, thank you very much. Let's open up for uh, for questions from the audience. Please identify yourself when you ask Yeah, I'm Howard Marks, and I wanted to commend you for uh, the program for uh, for bringing on this program today. Um, and also, Ambassador, thank you for your public service. Um, my question is sort of a follow-up to the move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So I think uh, there are those who support the move who are concerned that there will, you know, there are people obviously as referred to in the State Department who are opposed to this and at the middle level, lower level, and they will work maybe against meeting this goal. So. What reassurance do you give us that this will actually occur? And maybe if you could share some uh, timelines with us, like where does this stand now? What about acquisition of property? All of the sort of like the details that are necessary in order for this thing to actually occur. Thank you. Uh, uh, the US Embassy in Jerusalem will open in mid-May. Um, that is a statement of fact. And there is no effort, there has never been any effort uh, from the moment we began the work with the White House, and we were deeply involved with the President and his staff on the crafting of his declaration, uh, on the crafting of the specific document, 
uh, which he signed. Every word that he said, every word he wrote was carefully chosen, both what was said and what was not said, to define two specific steps. The opening of the U.S. Embassy to Israel in Jerusalem and the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Uh, and the president made clear at the time what we were not doing. We were not determining uh, the dimensions of sovereignty, the boundaries of sovereignty, the geographic uh, qualities of sovereignty. That had to be resolved as a result of direct negotiations. But the embassy will open. Um, what we intend to do is to have a facility where the ambassador and the small staff will be able to work uh, in a secure setting. We will be, over the next uh, year, expanding that to a slightly larger interim facility. Uh, and then we will have the process, which we go into everywhere around the world, of the construction of a full-scale uh, mission. And whether it is uh, in Berlin, in Jerusalem, uh, in Bangkok, these are multi-year and extraordinarily expensive propositions anywhere in the world. But absolutely, the embassy will open uh, in about a month's time. Uh, uh, Gary, you could, uh, you could give the microphone. The, mic the microphones can come to you, so uh, please go ahead, Gary, introduce yourself. Um, thanks very much, uh, Ambassador. I'm Garrett Mitchell. I write uh, something called the Mitchell Report. And um, I'm confused. And, um, and I think I've been paying attention. So here's, here's the, the question I want to get at. You have, uh, on multiple occasions and responses to Shibley's questions, said we are working on that. We have been doing this. We have been doing that. And I want to get inside the pronoun. And I don't mean name names. But for those of us who are sort of on the outside, it's pretty clear, uh, you may not agree with this, but it is pretty clear that we have an administration uh, that at best is having a very difficult time having a policy on almost any issue, certainly those in the foreign policy and national security arena, whether it's Korea, uh, the multiple positions on Syria just in the last two or three weeks. Uh, we know uh, we know that you don't agree with the characterization of, of Secretary Powell's about ripping the guts out, but it's also clear that there are a lot of vacant offices at the State Department. There are a lot of vacant offices elsewhere throughout the government. And we know that this president um, had, uh, by a factor of about five, the highest turnover of any president uh, since people have been keeping score. That would lead people like myself to say, <clears throat> uh, we, are, we are in a state of chaos right here in our own country when it comes to policy making. And yet, as I listen to you, uh, I, I get precisely a different sense. Uh, a lot of that has to do with your, your own composure and your ability to do this. But this is a serious question. And, and, uh, and, and what it's about is, if we are really working on this and we are making progress, where is that we located? And why don't we see it or feel it or see it expressed in actual policy? Great, clear. Um, and Paul, why don't you ask your question and then we'll have him answer both questions at the same time. Yeah, Paul Salem from the Middle East oh. Institute. Uh, nice to see you, Ambassador Satterfield. Thank, Thank you for you. your remarks. And thank you for your work in the Middle East, and I dare say for the Middle East. Uh, I know where your heart is, and, um, uh, and thank you for that. My question uh, is sort of a broad question reflecting on your 40 years as a diplomat and a, and a statesman, uh, and on a, the complex issue uh, that is brought up in the Syrian case, that was brought up in the Libyan case, uh, which is when a government uses unlimited organized force against its own population. I mean, obviously the chemical weapons issue is clear, there's no mm -hmm. debate about that. Uh, but on the question of a government's indiscriminate use of government power against its own population, uh, under the Obama administration, there was action in Libya, there was it in Syria. Of course, the Security Council, the Russian position was different, maybe the experience in Libya 
uh, brought out a different result. But my, my question is a bit broader on that, and I know it's a very complex issue. Uh, but for U.S. sort of global policy and its attempt to create some form of global order, how that links to national security interests, do you see a, an interest, a policy that needs to be crafted, even if it's complex, over this issue? Uh, and, and that was obviously a movement that was emerging under the responsibility to protect norm that was beginning to emerge. Uh, uh, and is there, is there a policy that can be crafted there or is it simply too hard or too idealistic? Uh, what would your thoughts on that be? Let Paul, let me re respond to yours first and then I will go to the, the, the broader question that you posed. Paul, of course, there's a need for an overarching strategic approach, or as much of one as you can construct. It is for any time and any place. Sometimes the demands are greater. Sometimes the ability to see the dimensions of such a strategy and what the instrumentalities are for affecting that strategy, economic, political, diplomatic, social, military, are clear sometimes less. The United States faced after the end of the Second World War, an extraordinarily difficult global situation for all of the extraordinary success of the victory over the fascist powers. How did you deal with the consequences of the war in terms of the dislocation and disruption in Asia, in Europe? The resurgence of the Soviet Union from the point of weakness pre-war internal uh, destruction from the purges into a much more aggressive, assertive force, inflicting, in our view, harm, suffering, misery, where it went, but with limits on the ability of any US government to pivot from the war against the Nazis and the Japanese into a new war against the Soviet Union. How did you come up with a policy? Anyone who thinks it was simple in that period, 45 to 48, 49, to craft a policy wasn't paying attention. It was difficult, it was challenged. And a strategy that was settled on was one of containment. Careful, studied containment. You looked for opportunities, small, medium, or large, if they presented. Sometimes they didn't. You accepted the fact as a strategic matter. There was going to be suffering. There were going to be deaths, sometimes of, of a terrible character and scale but you judged where application of US instrumentalities were appropriate and likely to lead to success and where that application could have produced a much worse deteriorated situation, less security, less stability. And that was a policy which for decades had broad bipartisan support despite the problems, despite the negatives that emerged during and as a result of such a policy. And in the end, one could argue, I would, it worked. It was effective. Now, how do you deal with the challenges we confront in the Middle East, or in many places outside the Middle East, where you don't have, as a result of generational historic inheritance legacy of dysfunctional systems across the board? How do you deal with the projection of threat and risk? Because as I've said, the ability to project is transnational, transregional now. It can't be contained and limited in a classic sense. And I think we're going to have to be very thoughtful and very careful about how we reconstruct or construct anew this kind of risk mitigation, threat mitigation regime, which is based upon a recognition, the inheritance of Iraq, of Libya, of Afghanistan, that you cannot endlessly expend whether you is the US alone, the US and a handful of allies, Western, Arab. You cannot endlessly engage in forever wars with expenditure of treasure and above all blood, boots and shoes on the ground without demonstrating outcomes. It isn't sustainable, not as a matter of proposition, but demonstrated fact. It's not sustainable, not here, not in Europe. But you can't leave, you can't not have a strategy. You can't pivot away, not to the Pacific as in the previous administration, not anywhere. You need a sustainable strategy and containment acquired a bad odor 
after 89 to 91. Victory in Europe, collapse of the Soviet Union, clean outcomes, the arc of history bending ever swifter to its close. Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. It didn't happen. History goes on. But you need a strategy to adjust to this, and one that is supportable and sustainable and explainable. And I think we are in the, the throes of evolving such a strategy now, because this is going to be a challenge. The risks, the threats to us, to the global community, are going to continue for quite some time. They are the legacy of at least a century of decisions taken and not taken in society and governance and economics and politics. You're not going to cure this in a day or a year or five or a decade. You have to do what is sustainable and explainable as a policy. Now, that is not an address to any particular administration. It's a challenge every administration has to take on. But we take it on with the specific legacy of the past 16 or 15 years since the overthrow of Saddam through the other experiences that have marked us. So it's simply whatever place you come from uh, on rightness, wrongness of those things, it's a reality. It's here, it's in Europe as well. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. Your question, uh, I have to tell you, uh, very frankly, I have not seen in terms of the policy world in which I work uh, the attributed chaos and disorder uh, that the press would have us believe. And I can only tell you, I can understand why that is portrayed, uh, but in the inner workings of the government, it, it is a quite rational process. You may agree or disagree with the outcomes of the policy process, but to believe the process doesn't exist interagency, that's the we I speak of. It's there. It works. Can I, can I just follow up? Uh, uh, just quickly, because we really are running out of time. We have two more, but just a quick follow-up. I'm just going to say I, 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 I think about um, what was said at the UN about Russia and what the president said about Russia. So you're right. I don't agree. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't agree with him, obviously, the whole, the whole you know, uh, debate uh, out in, in, in the open. Um, I, uh, we'll have uh, and introduce yourself and, uh, uh, and Ziad also introduce yourself. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim with the University of Maryland. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, I was scared to hear today about the killing of the seven Iranian soldiers. Uh, knowing the track record of the Iranians, they don't turn the other cheek. So chances are this could really escalate and hoping that the Russians will kind of plead to them to do nothing. I personally don't think that's going to happen. So the question to you, sir, is what is the official U.S. position on that? Because that may drag us into a war. And uh, second, maybe more optimistic scenario, uh, if there is anything predictable about President Trump, that is unpredictable. In a few weeks, he will be meeting with little rocket, rocket man. We didn't expect that three weeks ago. But what if he decides in three weeks to meet also with the Ayatollah? What will be the shape of the Middle East, in your opinion? I am certainly not going to comment on that last uh, hypothetical, but I will comment on your first uh, question. We would strongly, strongly recommend to all parties uh, associated with Iran against a further provocative escalation. It is their aggressive proliferation of weaponry into Syria and through Syria into Lebanon that has created this instability. We strongly and unequivocally defend and support Israel's right to act in its own defense. We would very much uh, hope all parties with the ability to influence Tehran's behaviors did so now. And the last question from Ziad. Phillips. Yes, Ziad Hassan, great to Ziad. see you. Uh, it's clear everybody's in agreement that there is no possibility of an agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis on any issues in the foreseeable future. I mean, everybody keeps talking about two-state solution. It's, it's not in the offerings. No other solutions are in the offering. One thing that uh, has not been developed, at least to my knowledge, 
is a transition policy between now, where nothing is possible, and the distant future where there has to be some kind of an accommodation in the Middle East about something, and we should not predict it. Nobody should be in the business of predicting with policies that are so different and so divided. What is possible is to actually explore how do you detoxify and depolarize during this period of transition where you improve the living conditions of the Palestinians in a serious way, mm -hmm. not a proclaimed policy. I've been witness to that. Uh, it, it, so that people would actually experience the benefits of a better education, better health, better governance, better uh, 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 rules of the road, everything. Why is it intimately associated with this question of long-term policy on one state, two states. Why should not this be an objective in and of itself for the foreseeable future where it would make it possible perhaps for the Palestinian people at large and their polity as well as the Israeli polity to develop into some kind of a closer convergence? Ziad, I violently agree with you. Well, let's go then. Well, um, I, I um, before I, I end and thank you, I just want to uh, make a note about um, uh, one issue we didn't, of course, discuss on, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is what's happening in Gaza, talking about the humanitarian situation where uh, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the large protests uh, that are uh, 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 being uh, uh, confronted by the Israelis with many Palestinian casualties, um, put that aside in terms of you know, what, what the politics of it, everybody has an agenda. But the humanitarian situation in Gaza, the political situation in Gaza is extraordinarily unbearable that must be addressed. And regardless of the politics, somebody's got to deal with it. And we're allowing, obviously, the conflict to prevent us from, from moving in that direction. And with that, I think one of the reasons why you hear skepticism, and I don't think it's just Gary, but I think you, you you, you heard some of it about sort of what takes place in the administration, is that uh, who, wh when you ask the question, who is the we, uh, because of, you know, seeming conflict. You know, we know how the decision comes. It's only the decision comes out of the White House for sure. But the statements even on Gaza, the State Department puts an issue saying people have the right to peaceful protest. Then you get a, uh, the envoy saying essentially this is an incitement to violence. And... So people are confused. Sometimes we're confused by the shift in policy that happens before you even can react to it, such as are we pulling out of Syria or are we staying in Syria? Um, so we are facing something that is, I think, a little bit different than my own experience. Maybe you've experienced it in the 40 years. But I can tell you one thing. Uh, we are grateful that people like you are prepared to serve the American people, and we're grateful for the 40 years that you put to serve us all. Thank you, Sherman. And, and, uh, and we are proud that you are a Turk, and we're grateful that you took the time to spend uh, an hour, uh, half a day, really, with us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. Thanks, Sherman.